Her arm hurt. She was so, so tired. Her arm hurt. She was numb to the cold at this point, but kept shivering anyway. Her arm hurt. The only thing close to heat that she felt was the inflammation that was serving to add more throbbing pain to her arm, which hurt in case that wasn't clear. She turned her head to look at it, wincing from the pain the movement caused. It was ugly to behold, with a ragged stab wound in the muscles of her forearm near the elbow that was still slowly trickling blood, but that wasn't even the worst part of it. She knew from experience that the needle-sharp pain she felt with every slight movement meant that some bone in there, probably the radius or ulna, was also either hairline fractured or broken entirely. And just in case you weren't aware, fun fact, it hurt a lot. The pain was only exacerbated by the swollen tissues and irritation around the stab wound that she knew meant it was definitely infected. With what? She could only guess. Whatever it was, she could feel the fever it was causing having a desperate tug of war with the cold autumn air to determine her body temperature. When she couldn't stand to look at it any longer, she leaned her head back, resting it against the dew-filled grass of the ditch she was lying in, and looking up at the star-filled night sky that was slowly lightening to that hue of dark indigo that meant dawn was close, but not quite there. She used to think the stars were beautiful, but as she lay there, the dreadful memories of what had led to this moment playing over and over in her head, suffice to say, nothing in this world or outside of it seemed beautiful anymore. She put the aesthetics of the sky aside and instead struggled to focus her thoughts through the haze of fatigue and pain. Dawn approaching, that has to mean I've been laying here. Jeez, it must be almost an entire day at this point. I think. It hasn't been multiple days, surely. Or maybe it's been, oh, to hell with it. I don't even care at this point. She was too tired to sleep, but in too much pain to move. Her brain was fogged from fatigue, and even more so from the constant screaming coming from her nerve endings, desperately trying to let her know that yes, something was very wrong with her arm, she got it. Thanks for the message. You can stop now. Um, but mostly the fog stemmed from that draining emotional and mental exhaustion that came with periods of grief. A single tear ran down her face from her already overworked tear ducts, nearly reaching the bruises on her neck before it was wiped away by the shaky fingers of her good arm. The sky would be there for her to look at later. She needed to try, yet again, to rest. Just one more time. You know what they say, she murmured to herself. Seventy-six times the charm, delirious with exhaustion and the fever as she was. She couldn't help herself from chuckling at the thought. Her eyes, bloodshot and burning from the strain she had endured, lazily looked around at what few constellations she could recognize for one last time, and spotted the pattern of Orion in the night sky. Hey, Big O, close the door on your way out, eh? I'm gonna try and take a snooze, she snorted, wincing as she did. Uh, finding my own jokes funny. Jesus, I am delirious. She turned her head to the side and closed her eyes, willing herself to please, please just go to sleep already. Because sleep meant being unconscious, and being unconscious meant she could ignore the pain from her arm for a while. And to her surprise, she finally started drifting off. Her breath slowed, the fog visible in the cold air in front of her mouth, coming less and less often as she drifted closer to the edge of unconsciousness. As a result, she barely even heard the soft humming noise approaching and almost didn't feel herself being gently, almost imperceptibly lifted off the ground. When she noticed it, what parts of her mind that were still semi-conscious brushed it off as either a dream or hallucination and slipped behind the wall of sleep. For all of two minutes, she wasn't getting off that easy. She was jolted awake by a sudden feeling of what could only be described as compression across her whole body, though compression hardly did it justice. It was as though she were being squeezed through a drinking straw, yet before she could react, the feeling was over. Her eyelids fluttered open, revealing a dimly lit room, alive with that same strange humming noise from before. She crinkled her nose at the smell that assailed her nostrils. It was strange like a combination of various industrial cleaners, engine grease, and ozone. She rubbed her eyelids before she groggily looked around, confused. Where was she? She turned her head and saw a very strange-looking machine that was seemingly floating in midair. She craned her neck, looking past it, and her eyes widened at what she saw glowing through a small, circular viewing window in the nearby wall. Was that Earth? She slowly, gingerly sat up, wincing from the protests her arm gave at her daring to do such a thing. It took everything in her, but she slowly dragged herself closer to the window, peering out at the planet slowly circling in the void below her. There was no doubt about it, that was Earth. She recognized North and South America, Greenland, even a portion of the Northern Arctic. She could even see all the wildfires burning as a result of, well, everything collectively hitting the fan in the past week. 
Tilting her head, she could see the exterior of the building, satellite, space station, whatever it was she was apparently on that was outside the window. Gunmetal gray and covered in strange symbols in a language she didn't recognize. It was unlike anything she'd seen before, and it wasn't alone. She saw several other similar things floating nearby. They ranged in size from the relatively small, around the size of a house, to absolutely massive ones that she estimated must be miles across. She shook her head in disbelief and laid her head back down on the cold metal floor. Okay, scratch that. She was obviously still asleep. After all, this had to be the weirdest dream she'd ever had. Suddenly, a scraping, screeching noise rang through the room, startling her. She looked around and saw a tall, lanky, shadowy figure entering the room they were in as it finished sliding open the metal door that was the source of the noise. Without warning, the room was aglow with a bright light from overhead, causing her to wince and close her eyes. She rubbed her eyelids again, trying to ignore the irritation the action caused, and looked back at the figure, eyes widening as they adjusted to the light, and then even wider as she froze in place with a gasp at what she saw. The creature standing over her was like some horrific combination of a reptile and insect. Its frame was slim and bipedal, with limbs proportioned far longer than any normal human. It towered over her, easily seven feet tall or more. Its head was like that of a praying mantis minus the antennae, with three chameleon-like eyes. The first eye was symmetrically centered in the forehead. The other two mirrored on the sides of its head, where the temples on a human head would be, and all three were very intently focused on her. On its face was a glowing, bioluminescent set of growths all down the front, forming a V-shaped, curving pattern that almost looked like a deranged smile, but its real mouth hid behind a pair of razor-sharp mandibles on its jawline that clicked together a few times as she watched. Its hide was dark gray and shiny, almost metallic, somewhere between reptilian scales and an insectoid carapace, and generally looked like it would be at home in an H.R. Geiger painting. The bioluminescent growths on its face continued down to its torso in three vertical parallel lines, growing larger as they went further down. Each gangly arm ended in four chitin-covered fingers, tipped with razor-sharp claws. The only thing even remotely resembling clothing it was wearing was something that looked like a long skirt or kilt, which would probably almost look funny if it weren't for the fact that the material it was made of almost looked like human skin. From what she saw of the legs underneath it, they were digitrade, and almost like those of a bird, with three toes in front and one facing backwards, all with very long claws on them. But no feathers could be seen, just more of that sickly gray chitinous carapace. It stood there for a second. Silently watching her, she sat there trembling, now more from fear than cold or fever before all its glowing growths suddenly began to gleam blood red, and it reached out towards her with one of its clawed arms, whilst making a terrifying noise, like the hiss of a cat mixed with the warning signal of a rattlesnake. Her adrenaline spiked, and the various subdivisions of her brain responsible for survival instincts went into overdrive. Each presented their findings for peer review. Thing big, deadly, scary. They rapidly formed a committee and held a brief conference as to the good and proper response to this interesting new development. The vote was both swift and unanimous. Run! The adrenaline surge gave her the endurance she needed to ignore the pain and scramble backwards before finally getting enough traction on the metal floor to get to her feet, turn and run, screaming through the opposite doorway, getting away from the monster as fast as she could. Yagdrasog flinched at the sudden movement of the human, scrambling awkwardly to her feet. With the help of her unbroken arm, before sprinting away from him whilst emitting a high-pitched noise he was unfamiliar with, presumably of distress. For a moment, he just stood there, puzzled. What was she doing and why? All he had done was say, hello. Then he remembered himself and figured he should probably resolve the situation before she bumbled her way out of the airlock or something. He called after her. Wait, please stop. I mean you no harm. Why in the name of the spirits above are you running away from... His eyes widened, his bioluminescence rapidly shifting to a bright white as he realized. Oh, blast. I forgot to turn my auto-translator back on. He tapped the side of his head to bring up his cranial implant's heads-up display interface and quickly went through a few drop-down menus. Finally, finding the setting he was looking for, he turned the software back on and then started to run after her. He shook his head as he went, irritated at himself, as his bioluminescence changed to an annoyed green to match. Great first impression, you absent-minded fool. From her perspective, she's just been abducted to an unknown environment. And I may very well have just declared my intent to kill her in a language she likely doesn't even have the biology to speak properly, let alone the knowledge to understand. 
He let out a frustrated sigh and just kept following the loud, high-pitched noises wincing as he did so. His ears hurt. Fifteen minutes ago, Yuktrazog nervously whistled to himself as he remotely piloted an unmanned stealth drone from his cloaked ship in the upper atmosphere of the alien planet, yet every so often did a happy little wiggle in his seat at the terminal. Despite the danger in what he was doing, he was shaking with excitement and literally glowing with glee, which, if you were curious, happened to be a lovely shade of banana yellow. You see, Yug Drezog worked as a galactic interplanetary system scout, colloquially known as a spacer, among the citizens of the Uldril Galactic Collective, a governmental alliance between a wide variety of different sapient species that also happened to be his employer. His main function was piloting his personal scout ship to uncharted star systems, to summarily ununchart them. While in this line of employment, he had been witness to countless wondrous things. He had seen stars go supernova, witnessed space dust forming beautiful nebulas tens of light years wide, and caught the frosted trails of comets, slinging close enough to a star to off-gas their icy payloads. But nothing even came close to this, to every spacer's wildest, most fantastical dream discovery. Life, and not just any life, sapient life. As the drone flew through the sky, descending toward the surface of the planet below, he reminisced on that fateful day, approximately six planetary months ago. He had been scouting the ice and gas giants in this yet uncharted solar system, scanning their composition with the unmanned probe drone he used to sample geological deposits, take gas samples, and so on to determine if they could be possible new sources of rare elements to harvest for the collective. He had just finished probing the seventh planet out from the star when he suddenly picked up multiple abnormal readings, originating from the ocean planet of the system. He sighed, figuring it would just be the usual some leftovers from a solar flare that affected its magnetosphere or some such. As he listened in through his radiation wavelength analyzer, he expected to hear the meaningless, purposeless static he had heard hundreds of times before. Instead, he heard strange patterns. Hang on, was that, were those, they were, voices in a language he didn't recognize. He recorded a sample, then pulled up his auto-translator and had his ship's analytical programs study it in case it was a distress call from some poor sap who had crash-landed their spacecraft. But not a single known language was a match. He scratched his head, puzzled. Could it be a code of some sort? It wasn't uncommon for smugglers, pirates, spies, and other off-the-books types to hole up on uncharted worlds and use coded verbiage to prevent detection by collective authorities. He had the ship analyze it to at least determine what collective species those who produced the noises were. But again, no matches not even when he had it scan the audio samples for possible voice altering. He sat back in his pilot seat, stumped. Then he started connecting the dots. If those producing these noises weren't recognized as a species already included in the collective, that meant these were the voices of a species unknown to the collective, an unknown species, but one that was, was nonetheless smart enough to use radio waves. His eyes flew open and his bioluminescence began to glow the pure white of sudden realization. By the spirits, it was a new sapient species. He leapt up from his chair and would have nearly deafened anyone nearby with the joyfully excited noises he started to make. Luckily, however, he was in space, and after all, in space, no one can hear you squee. It took him nearly an hour to calm down enough to call it in over his quantum communicator and provide the audio samples he had recorded. Then another hour to reassure his liaison on the other end countless times that no, this was not a joke. This was not a lie, an elaborate prank or some such. Yes. He would be more than willing to testify to the truth of his statements in a collective court. And yes, this was in fact the once in multiple millennia moment he and most every spacer in the entirety of the collective always dreamed of. This was a new first contact. As Yggdrasog left memory lane and turned back onto present day boulevard for a moment, he let the controls go and proceeded to spin around in his chair in sheer excitement, whilst giggling like a madman, literally glowing with giddiness before swiftly grabbing the control stick again before the drone drifted off course. He found a new sapien species. He did. He'd be in the collective history archives for the rest of time. Months of preparations had to be done beforehand, of course. He had to wait a few long, long days on the outskirts of the solar system with his ship in full stealth mode, so as to avoid attracting attention from the new species until the time was right, before a truly staggering amount of collective ships arrived chock full of top experts in all sorts of social and scientific fields to fill any conceivable role 
in the analysis of this new species. While he wasn't allowed to participate in the work himself or see most of what they were doing, he was nonetheless ecstatic with the knowledge that the work was being done all because of him. Plus, at least he could attend certain intelligence briefings on their main findings, as well as look at heavily redacted versions of some of the results of their endeavors. Various scientists from the myriad collective species and dozens more scientific disciplines had gathered together, set up shop within a day, and gotten to work. They performed long-distance surface scans, mapped the planetary geography, and analyzed their atmosphere and planetary conditions to determine what collective species might be compatible for potentially cohabitating with them. Yggdrasog was delighted to learn that they utilize oxygen for respiration, just as his species, Lumagog, and tens of others in the collective did, in contrast to collective species who had to have, say, an atmosphere mostly composed of carbon dioxide, who were out of luck. Additionally, they drank the same liquid water for fluid regulation in their bodies, as his own people did, though admittedly at a much narrower spectrum of salinity than his own species was capable of tolerating. He found that a bit tragic. There was so much water to be found in their homeworld's oceans, yet unlike his own people, who could drink from nearly any water on their homeworld, these humans could only drink what they called fresh water. However, any sadness he felt about their situation faded when he learned that the gravity of their homeworld was only 1.04x that of his own species' homeworld. In combination with the other factors involved, this meant that at least in the case of Lumagogs, the answer of cohabitation was a very solid yes. Moving along, the scientists in charge of engineering and military endeavors <laughs> surreptitiously analyzed the humans' levels of technology to determine their capabilities, if they were a potential threat to the collective, and so on. They were deemed to quote, the spokesman of the collective military, mostly harmless. Yggdrasog thought this might be a bit unfair, that is, until he read the reports, and found yet another reason to pity them. From what little he was able to read of the heavily redacted documents, the humans were very, very primitive spirits. They hadn't even developed fusion yet. Still, that was all the more reason to help them. And to do so, they needed a proper line of communication. Countless diplomats, ambassadors, emissaries, and representatives of every collective race were attending seminars on all the sociological experts, were learning about the species' social norms across distinct cultures, and most importantly, the linguistic experts and etymologists got the ball rolling for the true AI algorithms of the larger vessels, far more complex than his own ship's operating systems, which only measured in at a few paltry yottabytes to sort out the languages these humans used. Speaking of, just how many languages did they need? With each additional language that was added to the auto-translator databases, he thought surely this one will be the last. But no, you couldn't swing around a noodle of spaghetti. The humans always seemed to choose such silly names for their food without hitting someone speaking a new language. But all the pity, sadness, and frustration he felt was outweighed by the jubilation he felt knowing that all these countless man hours of hundreds of individuals per each and every collective species were happening because of him. All these people were here because he found them, and he was ecstatic at the impossibly exciting prospect of welcoming this new species into the collective or on the off chance they didn't wish to join them. It was determined that it was safe to at least uplift them technologically so that they could be potential new allies, as well as potentially provide new avenues for trade and commerce of never-before-seen exotic goods. After all, there was hardly any risk in doing so, as they were quite literally outnumbered by over a million to one by the allied races of the collective. And after all that, when they had quadruple-checked everything, then quadruple-checked it again to be absolutely sure, the day of first contact finally came. Everyone brought out the celebratory drinks, snacks, and party favors. The diplomats sent out their messages in hundreds of human languages, declaring a desire for peaceful contact promises to assist them in the technological uplifting of their species to a post-scarcity way of life and an offer to join the collective for the benefit of all parties involved. And then, nothing, no response. After a few nervous, awkward hours of sitting alongside the other low-ranking crewmates of the larger vessels, he and all those around him got orders of radio silence from high command and for all the non-essential personnel to return to their ships and wait for further orders. As he remembered the sinking feeling he'd experienced at that moment, Yggdrasog unconsciously gripped the drone control stick much tighter than necessary. All that waiting, the agonizing waiting for them to greet this new species, 
The one he found, and for what? More, thrice damned, waiting. But this time, there wasn't even a payoff to look forward to, and no one above would tell him what was going on. He didn't know why there was suddenly so much smoke in the air of the planet, nor what all those bright flashes lighting up the atmosphere midway through the first day were, and there were certainly no answers coming from high command. He had to sit there in his spacecraft and just wait. One planetary day passed, then another, then another, and so on. In the downtime, he read and reread the guidelines for first contact back to back over and over again, trying to find out what the possible reason for the wait could be. Unfortunately, all that availed him was eye strain and an extreme amount of boredom from trudging through all the legalese. After a week of sitting around, watching the planet slowly spin beneath him while in orbit, he couldn't stand it any longer. He needed to know what was happening. He needed to act, if only to silence the creeping dread that had slowly but surely permeated his entire being, a dread born of the worry that something had gone horribly catastrophically wrong. And thus, an idea formed, his drone. He knew the human's tech levels. There was a smaller chance they could detect him than the literally astronomically low odds of him finding this species to begin with. Instead, he was far more worried about the potential ramifications. If anyone from high command knew what he was up to, long before the radio silence commenced, he was told in no uncertain terms that, no, he couldn't scan the planet, no. He couldn't act as an ambassador, yes, they really meant it. And no, it didn't matter that he really, really, really wanted to help somehow. Please, 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 please. And after that last bit, they shut down his outgoing comms to high command for a full planetary month. Jerks. Or more importantly, he was told that while no, he couldn't help in the preparation process, after first contact commenced, his main function would be to do what he did best, scouting and scanning to tease out any additional information he could on the planet's natural resources in order to assist with the technological uplift process. The thing is, they had given no specific time frame, just after first contact commenced. Technically, the current time frame satisfied that condition. So technically, he wasn't doing anything he wasn't supposed to. He was just, uh, taking initiative. They couldn't court-martial him for just doing a little scanning here and there to get ahead of his own workload, surely. <laughs> and it would just be an entirely coincidental, happy accident if while doing this, he managed to find out what in the name of the spirits above was happening. And so he had slowly, carefully moved his ship in such a way that he was currently orbiting in what he hoped was the blind spot of most of the ships of any higher-ups. Uh, purely so as to uh, better position his drone's entry point into the atmosphere, yes. Rest assured, he was only motivated by uh, avoiding negative weather patterns. <laughs> or something like that. Once in position, he released and directed it towards the planetary surface. If Lumigogs had sweat glands, his would have been in nervous overdrive as the drone descended through the atmosphere. Would he be detected? Would this all be for naught? He waited, glancing between the ships around him and the drone's interface on his monitor. But from his readings on the other vessels, it seemed like all the command ship's sensors were focused on the bigger population centers of the planet. He let out the breath he didn't realize he was holding. He was safe, if only for now. He'd have to focus on a rural area. Despite every loophole and excuse he could come up with, he'd still be much better off remaining undetected and not interfering in whatever might be going on in more concentrated pockets of the species. It would likely take much longer to gather information this way than heading towards the larger population centers in search of clues. But he could still poke around on the sly for any information he could tease out from the surroundings. And hopefully then, he could finally get the answers he so desperately craved. Alter descent velocity, slow to 50% speed, and activate autopilot mode. Yogodrasog looked at the aerial scans, deciding that what seemed to be an area focused on harvesting crops with a long road running alongside it, dotted with the occasional primitive ground vehicle, would be as good a place to start as any. He highlighted the road with a flick of a clawed finger. Descend to 100 meters above planet surface, then follow a highlighted path at 20% speed. Proceed. As the drone dutifully obeyed his commands and traveled along the stretch of paved road for a time, he was surprised at the lack of humans to be found, despite the vehicles present. Each and every one had seemingly been abandoned. They all sat still, unmoving. His curiosity peaked. He highlighted a few of them in the control interface. Halt forward momentum. Descend to 50 meters from planetary surface. Scan and analyze condition of marked targets. As he finished his verbal command, the familiar synthesized voice of his drone's onboard computer blared to life from the speakers of his terminal. Processing. Scan complete. Severe damage detected to internal electronic systems. Necessary for automated function in all nearby vehicles, rendering them inoperable 
without complete overhaul of damaged parts. Cause unknown. He shook his head, puzzled. What happened here? All right, ascend 300 meters from planetary surface. Continue forward movement following the highlighted path, 15% speed. Farther and farther the road stretched, but he didn't see a single human upon it, nor in the surrounding area. He sighed and absentmindedly gazed around at the surrounding environment. He couldn't help but marvel at how, well, alien it all looked. The taller plant life he saw appeared to be quite complex. Their stems covered in thick fiber and their extremities full of, oh, what was the word, leaves? He hadn't paid all that much attention during the portions of his schooling that covered exotic alien plant life found on feral worlds and the various homeworlds of the other races of the collective. He figured he'd never really need to interact with much beyond the giant fungal pods, great lichen growths, and so on of his homeworld. He was a spacer for spirit's sake, not a xenobotanist, and wait, what was that? Halt forward momentum. Reverse 50 meters. Pan visual sensors left 30 degrees. He squinted at the incoming visual feed. He was right. There was something laying in that ditch. Probably just a random piece of detritus, but better safe than sorry. He highlighted it. Scan target. Assess. Processing, partial scan complete. Target identified as matching category fauna. Distance reduction necessary for further information via close range scans. Descend toward target, 5% speed, 2% halt. His eyes narrowed further as he zoomed the forward visual lens in. Whatever it was, it looked to be a biped and, wait a minute, he recognized that body structure. Spirits be praised, this had to be one of the members of the new species. It they, he corrected himself had pale skin, long, dark brown fur atop their head, and were wearing clothing covering their torso and legs, though much of it was stained red, running all down the left side of their body. What were they doing all the way out here in the middle of nowhere? And why were they laying in a ditch unmoving? Were they okay? Scan target and establish connection to ship autodoc subsystem. Assess physical condition and cross-reference with known anatomical data of species designation, human. Processing, scan complete. Species designation, human, alive. Biological sex, female. Age estimated to between 20, 25 planetary years. Body temperature measured at below optimal levels for species, indicating minor hypothermia. Severe damage detected in the internal structures of bone and left upper limb. Severe tissue damage detected consistent with moderate impalement in left upper limb. Loss of significant volume of internal fluids necessary for function detected. Multiple contusions on throat detected. Foreign bacteria buildup within wound detected alongside inflammation, indicates infection in wounded limb. Cause of damage, unknown. Yogi Drasag nervously swallowed, trying to center himself and focus despite what he had just heard. Well, that certainly answered that. No, she very much was not okay. Whatever had happened to her really messed her up. Analyze if damage sustained is life-threatening without intervention, given circumstances and location. Processing, analysis complete. Most recent collective-based scan of structures in the region determine nearest human medical facility equipped to treat individual located approximately 20.4 kilometers away, if flown 24.3 kilometers away, by landbound vehicle travel on roads, damage to nearby ground vehicles and lack of individuals to operate them, calculated to significantly slow any attempt at rescue via ground transport, no human aircraft detected within the region. No functional land-based vehicles detected in the immediate area. Likelihood of survival without outside intervention very low. He swore under his breath. Uh, expand and clarify analysis. Processing. While wound would normally not be life-threatening. Progression of bacterial infection. Necessitating taxing immune system. Response in combination with lack of access to fluids and nutrients. To replace those lost indicate subject will expire within approximately 1.3 planetary day cycles without outside intervention. C certainty of analysis conclusion? Processing, certainty of conclusion, 99.9999972%. He put his head in his hands, his bioluminescence flickering between several colors. None of them good. Spirits above, she was going to die unless someone helped her, but he was in no position to do so. He knew deep down that he was deluding himself if he thought he could get away with this if he was caught. No amount of loophole abuse and legitimate excuses could save him from severe negative repercussions. Not when it came to something as serious as first contact. She's going to die. He was already risking enough as it was. She's going to die. Maybe he could let someone in one of the other ships know. No, that would give away that he'd been poking around on the sly. She's going to die. Maybe 
Maybe someone else would find her in time and they could save her. Or maybe, despite the odds, she might just get better on her own. Even if it took her past the 1.3 cycle mark to do so, there was still a... His eyes narrowed as he did the math. 0.0000028% chance that she could survive. And a chance was a chance. Uh, right. She's going to die. No one would know if he didn't intervene. It would be so easy. No chance of getting caught. No risk. No danger. Just pull the drone prone back to the ship, return to his original position, scrub the flight logs, and... She's going to die! No. No, she's not. He opened his eyes and spoke, voice full of grim certainty. Descend to two meters above highlighted subject. Very, very carefully use stasis field to attach to subject. Entangle her matter with an equivalent mass of carbon from the fabricator hold. Then return to quantum anchor point with cargo and safely lower the subject prone beside the drone chassis. Proceed. Affirmative. Target acquired. Returning to drone bay via quantum tether with cargo in five, four. He got up from the terminal and took off for the drone bay as fast as his taloned feet could carry him, one thought repeating itself over and over in his head as he went, a mantra of sorts. She's going to live, present. As has already been said, Yogodrasog had seen some seriously amazing things working as a system scout, but what hasn't been made clear is that it's not all starshine and rainbows. A spacer's life is not an easy one. Many, many more such things he'd witnessed were horrible, tragic, and stark reminders of the fragility of life. He had seen a crewmate suffer catastrophic decompression due to a defect in their suit whilst doing a minor repair to the hull, suffocating in the void of space. He had seen the aftermath of those who cut corners and failed to double-check that their FTL routes were clear of any debris, resulting in their ships and everyone aboard being vaporized in an instant. He had seen terrible things that no one should have to bear witness to, things that eventually led to him vastly preferring to work alone. Throughout all of this, he took it upon himself to remain stoic, to keep going, no matter how much he wanted to give up. As a result, he liked to think it took a lot to phase him. And as he watched the pitiful creature before him, he was struggling to maintain the titanic willpower required to not start ugly crying on the spot. He had assumed that after catching up with her, she would have long since gotten over the initial surprise and panic upon realizing she had been abducted from her homeworld. She would have calmed down, they could have a nice conversation, as he treated her wounds, and she could catch him up on what was going on. She could shower him with praise for his heroic rescue. He could inquire about the answers he sought, and all would be well. That idyllic fantasy went right out of the airlock when he first peeked around a doorframe and finally spotted her. She was huddled in the shadows near one of the corners of his ship's equivalent of a living room, where she had hastily constructed, well, constructed is too strong a word, she had hastily thrown together in sheer panic a farcical barricade out of whatever was nearby. Cushions, pillows, a shelving unit, a few thermal blankets here and there, all of which he could easily step over. He could see through the shadows she clung to that she was still violently shivering. Her arm was bleeding worse than before. Her unfocused bloodshot eyes and rose-colored cheeks were wet, and her chest was heaving as she went from panicked hyperventilating to quiet sobs to mumbling to herself in a voice rendered hoarse from the initial screaming, which had, thankfully, stopped a few minutes hence. Though in all honesty, he was reconsidering whether the screaming was really as bad as he initially thought it was, as it took all of his effort to maintain his composure based on what he was hearing stream out of her mouth without pause and conveniently, if rather tragically, being auto-translated directly into his unfortunate ears. I'm dreaming, I'm dreaming. This has to be a dream. I was sleeping, wake up. Please wake up. This is a nightmare. This has to be a nightmare. Oh God, please wake up. He sighed calibrated his auto-translator to output the language she was speaking, which was apparently human English, along with the accent she was speaking with, Northwest American, whatever that meant, and slowly stepped into the room. He saw her jump at the sudden movement, look at him with terror in her eyes, then screw her eyes shut, blocking the outside world out as her voice became more and more desperate. I'm dreaming, I'm dreaming, wake up, wake up, wake up, wake up, oh God, please wake up, wake up. His willpower to avoid sympathy crying was cracking apart fast. He needed to end this quickly. He cleared his throat and addressed her with a voice he hoped sounded friendly. I, I assure you this is all very much real. Her bloodshot eyes flew open, staring at him, tears welling up from the recognition that he spoke truly. He slowly started walking towards her, but stopped as she let out a high-pitched shriek and struggled to get away from him again. Whatever had enabled her to ignore her condition and move with such haste, it was clearly wearing off. 
Her movements were slow and labored. Her legs couldn't support her weight, and it was all she could do to gradually drag herself backwards with her still functioning arm, her legs pathetically scrabbling at the floor in an ineffectual attempt to aid her movement. Please listen, I have no intention of, of... His voice trailed off as it became clear she was ignoring him, only focused on getting away. In her desperation, he saw her try and use her injured limb to help drag herself back faster, but she gasped and flinched, clutching at it in pain and nearly slumping over. She looked down at her arm, then glanced back at him, her eyes wide and fearful, before the awful babbling started again. This time, seemingly piteously pleading to no one in particular as her eyes unfocused in delirium. Please, oh please, don't let me die here. I don't want to die. I don't want to die. I'm not ready to die. Oh God, please someone help me. I don't want to. He tried to make a single step closer to her as quietly as possible, but all it did was cause her to flinch, clutch her injured arm tighter, and let out one final desperate scream. Oh God, please don't kill me. He nervously swallowed, wincing as she descended into hysterical sobs. This wasn't working. He was way out of his depth here. He was a spacer, not a diplomat, medic, or any profession that could be even slightly useful in these circumstances. Listen, I, you have to believe me. I truly have no intention whatsoever of causing you any harm. I, uh, in desperation, he struggled to try and remember what snippets of intel he had been able to catch about this species' physiology and psychology. Uh, just, just take a few deep breaths, okay? In and out, slow. Can you do that for me, please? He watched as she raised her head slightly and gazed at him, her eyes still wide and fearful. But as he continued to stand there, not daring to make any sudden movements, he noticed her breathing starting to slow and her shoulders relaxing ever so slightly. Good, good, that's a bit better. Um, can you please tell me your name? The human was unresponsive for several seconds before letting out a whimpered answer so quiet his auto-translator barely picked it up. Uh, Kate. Kate, all right. Kate, I know you're hurt, I know you're scared, and I know you're more than a little confused, but I genuinely only want to help you. A few moments of silence passed, broken only by the quiet sound of Kate's ragged breaths before he spoke again. The only reason I brought you here was due to your dire condition. At the time my scouting drone detected you and the distance between your position planet side and the closest human medical center. While your fluid loss by itself wouldn't have been enough to kill you, the ship's autodoc system also detected an infection growing within the wound that it calculated would almost certainly kill you before you could reach aid from your own kind. I merely wish to help you before your situation gets any worse. Several more long seconds of silence passed before she spoke again, her voice full of trepidation. Nah, okay. He let out a quiet but very relieved sigh. Good. This will only take a few moments. Trying to move as slowly and non-threateningly as he could, he gently reached up to a nearby panel on the wall and typed in a code. In response, a small hatch opened, revealing a spherical object about the size and shape of a softball with a large red button protruding from the top. He clutched it in his hand and slowly walked across the room, stepped over the barricade and knelt a few feet away from her. He carefully extended the device out to her, causing her to shrink back away from him. Trying to sound as sure of himself as he could, he spoke. This is just a normal, standard-issue medical droid. All collective ships are equipped with them. As a precaution, all ships in this solar system have had them updated with all knowledge of human anatomy we've been able to decipher so far. It's just going to administer a solution to flush the wound on your appendage of contaminants and sterilize it. Apply a harmless long-term antibacterial medical gel that will also serve to bind to any damaged tissues in order to stop the bleeding and help to speed the healing process. Then lastly, use... He paused. I suppose your race doesn't have this tech yet, uh, just think of the last step as having it install an advanced cast, prosthetic, thing that will prevent you from accidentally injuring yourself further. All I need you to do is just uncover your arm and remain as still as possible for a bit. Okay? He held his breath as she remained motionless for a few seconds, finally letting it out as she slowly, gingerly removed the hand she'd been clutching to the wound, wincing from the pain as she shifted slightly to face the droid. He pressed the red button and started to speak in a voice he hoped sounded gentle enough not to scare her, but authoritative enough that whoever heard it would think he was much more competent than he actually was at this type of thing. Race designation, human. Severe wounds on upper left appendage, rinse, gel, and precautionary mobilization on damaged limb. Proceed. The human watched with trepidation as the device popped open, revealing a set of tiny, dexterous, and very precise-looking instruments. Yogadrasog held it out towards her, and while she initially shrunk back, she stopped, took a deep breath, 
and finally leaned forward towards it. It went to work. And while she initially winced and cringed at the sensations, once the gel was applied, she relaxed, a relieved expression on her face. Finally, a small cloud of what looked like smoke at first glance trickled out of this device. But as they watched, it formed into what almost looked like a floating ball of tiny, gleaming silver gnats. Without warning, they moved toward her injured arm and, before she could react, landed on it, solidifying from a cloud into seemingly endless layers of complex geometric structures and attaching themselves to her, their movements slowing, then stopping. Kate flinched at the feeling. For a half second, it almost felt as though her arm was covered in ants, and it itched beyond belief, but the sensation died as quickly as it appeared. She looked at her arm in wonder. It was as though her broken arm was covered in liquid mercury, from her wrist to just above the elbow. But as she gingerly poked at it, it felt as hard and rigid as steel. She finally spoke in a raspy voice. What? What is this stuff? It's a collection of self-sterilizing nanobots programmed to human physiology. They will adapt to any movements you make in an attempt to keep your arm as still as possible as it recovers. If you were a member of my own species, they would also be applying pre-programmed stem cells to the bone and tissues to help repair them faster. But at this point, well, we still don't know enough about your kind for that sort of thing to be possible yet. So unfortunately, we'll just have to let your arm heal by itself. She looked at the substance for a few more moments before raising her head and glancing at him before quickly averting her gaze. W w what's your name? I'm Yagudrasog. She sniffled, eyes facing the floor, before replying in almost a whisper. Thank you. Yagudrasog's mandibles clicked together a few times in surprise, and his bioluminescence shifted hues to a soft, contented pink. Oh, my pleasure. They sat in silence for a moment before Yagudrasog motioned towards her arm. Uh, well, the droid has helped with making sure it won't get any worse. Now let's focus on working towards helping you get better. He gestured over his shoulder to the doorway. I have a spare room down the hall that I've mostly just used for storage since I started to fly alone, but you can use it for the time being. Nothing fancy, but it'll do until you're recovered. He began to reach out his hand to her. Here, let me help you to your feet. Kate's eyes widened and she clutched at her injured arm again. No, don't, don't touch me. Yukadresog paused, puzzled. Why not? No offense meant, but you're clearly in no state to walk and... Without warning, she grabbed at the wall, trying to get a grip and get up by herself, but grimaced and slid back down, her legs unable to support her weight. Kate, listen to me. You're just going to hurt yourself even more than you already are. You need help, and I can... I said, don't touch me. and I can do it myself. I just... I... <laughs> he silently held out his hand again. She glared defiantly at it for a second before pointedly looking away. There was a moment of tense silence before he broke it. I know very little of your people's cultural norms, but among my species... There is no shame or other such negative connotations to be found in accepting help freely offered. She remained silent. Her bottom lip trembled. I just, I don't want to see you in any more pain. She looked up at him. Her mouth opened and closed a few times, a tear slowly dripping down her face as she ran her hand over her injured arm. She pursed her lips, sighed, and very, very slowly reached out to grasp his hand. He gently hoisted her to her feet, and she hesitantly leaned on him as he slowly started walking her down the hallway. He talked as they went. I'm deeply, terribly sorry. When I first greeted you in the hangar, in my haste to help you, I had forgotten to turn my auto-translator on. I honestly didn't mean to scare you, and as I've said, I know next to nothing about your culture and interpersonal relationships, so I apologize if I've somehow caused offense to you in any way in my ignorance. I'm just trying to help, and, and his stammering trailed off as he struggled to find the words, but Kate just sighed and shook her head. Speaking in a hoarse voice, it's, look, it's fine. I'm just super confused, really disoriented, very exhausted, quite dehydrated, and probably missing a lot of blood, and I, uh, well. She glanced down at her arm, grimacing from the lessened but still present throbbing pain she still felt from the wound and the memories it brought. And the long and short of it is that I've had a very, very, very long and hard day. She looked up at him, a wry smile crossing her features after a few seconds. <laughs> I suppose it doesn't help that the first person I see upon waking up after being taken off of my planet is an alien with a massive height advantage, a damn near unpronounceable name, and who looks like a cross between a giant bipedal bug and glowing reptile monster. A moment passed before Kate's eyes widened in horror. In her delirium, she had just insulted an alien predator, even if it was meant in jest. Yugitrasog stopped and stared down at her letting what she said sink in before suddenly throwing his head back 
and making strange noises as his bioluminescence floundered about for a bit before landing on sunflower yellow and staying there for several seconds. Kate frantically weighed her options for a few moments. Violence, no chance. Running, no point. Then a realization hit her. He was laughing. It was an odd sound, like sandpaper on metal, mixed with something akin to a wind chime in hurricane winds. Upon realizing this, she gave a genuine smile for the first time in days and couldn't help but giggle with him, mostly in relief. As his laughter finally trailed off, Yggdrasog wiped away a green tear from one of his three eyes before continuing onwards down the hallway. Ah, oh, I very much needed that after all this. They continued making their way through the curved hallways of the ship before finally reaching and entering through another sliding doorway into the spare room. Yggdrasog awkwardly kicked a few dust-covered storage bins out of the way to clear the path to the bed as Kate looked around. The room was honestly rather plain to look at. The walls were the same matte gunmetal gray as the rest of the ship, and unadorned save for a few buttons here and there, and a small viewport looking out into the void of space. The only furnishings present, beside the stacks upon stacks of storage bins, were a desk, a chair for said desk, a footlocker, and, oddly enough, a rather normal-looking bed. Mattress, pillows, sheets, and all. The only strange thing was it was far longer than any bed she'd seen before, clearly proportioned for Yig Yugder, the alien's species. Kate stared in amusement at the bed for a second, before chuckling as he gently helped lower her down onto it. I don't know why, but I was expecting, I don't know, a burrow or a nest or something. This just looks like any normal bed you'd find on Earth. Yugdrasog looked down at her, confused. What's Earth? She gestured towards the nearby viewport in the wall to the planet below. You know, Earth, the planet we're currently orbiting? He cocked his head to the side and his bioluminescence changing to a baby blue with a slight tint of yellow. Wait, are, are you saying your species named your homeworld dirt? Kate stared blankly at him for a few moments. Some small, defiant part of her felt as though she should be offended on behalf of humanity that he would dare to question such a thing. And furthermore, okay, yeah, fair. She hadn't thought about it up until that point. But it did sound pretty stupid when you said it out loud. Look, I never said we were good at naming stuff. He shook his head in amusement as he dug out a few blankets from a nearby storage bin before handing them to her, which she gratefully accepted, shivering as she was. Rather, unique naming conventions aside, let's get back to more important, pressing matters. Unfortunately, the antibacterial gel and nanobots can only do so much. Your body needs to fight off the remnants of the infection that have worked their way too far into your body for the nanobots to risk sterilizing and rebuild your internal fluid supply. While I'm no medic, the treatments for those are universal across all life. Move as little as possible to conserve your energy and replace what was lost. In other words, your body needs food, liquids, and rest, all in great quantities. Luckily, the collective has gleaned a lot about your species' basic physiological needs. While yes, it's clear you're exhausted, we need to at least give your body something to work with before you sleep. So, what would you like to eat and drink? Kate ran a tongue that felt more like leather than muscle at this point over her dry, chapped lips. Water, please. I feel like I could drink an entire swimming pool. As for food, I'm, huh, come to think of it, I'm actually not hungry, oddly enough. She grimaced, suddenly feeling nauseous. In fact, even the thought of eating is kind of making me queasy. Yogdrasog's glow shifted to a pensive purple as he processed her words. Mmm, not too surprising, I suppose. You've clearly been through a lot. If I had to guess, the loss of appetite could be the result of some form of evolved stress response for you to ignore your needs to focus on the situation causing said stress. Alternatively, I know a few collective species have evolved adaptation responses to rapid blood loss in that their body's gastrointestinal system slows to conserve energy for more important functions and only restarts once the internal fluid supply has restored itself to a relatively safe level. Something similar to one, the other, or both may be happening here. Like I said, I'm not a medic, so I don't... He suddenly paused, his eyes widening as his bioluminescence shifted to a stark white. Ooh, there's an idea. He turned away from her and tapped a button next to the door before speaking aloud, seemingly to no one in particular. Say, Autodoc, what would you recommend a human suffering from recent severe blood loss consumed to help the recovery process? Or set output to language designated human English? Kate jumped at the unexpected noise of the crackling of speakers, then the simulated voice coming from what felt like all sides at once in the ship. Processing, nutrient sources with high amounts of iron and vitamin K by volume recommended. 
alongside water supplemented with sugars and electrolytes. Yggdrasug nodded. All right, I'll be sure to program the fabricator to supplement your food with the former once you get to the point where you feel like eating again. And we can do the latter immediately. He turned to Kate, who was currently busy looking around for the source of the noise, an incredibly bewildered expression on her face. Who or what uh, was that? What? Oh, of course. Apologies. That's the ship's auto dock, or rather it's a subroutine of the ship's very, very extensive and complex programming that's colloquially known as the auto dock by most spacers. It's in charge of assessing the medical needs of the crew, be it mine or in this case, unexpected alien guests. Kate stared at him for a few seconds before slowly raising an eyebrow. You come to my planet, whisk me away into a spaceship, and you're calling me the alien here? Yugudrasog's face and mine blanked for a moment. Uh, you know, when you put it that way, I suppose. I mean, I, uh... His bioluminescence shifted to an embarrassed orange as he awkwardly trailed off, before turning toward the doorway with his metaphorical tail between his legs. <laughs> I'll just go get your water, 